Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. To contextualize today's the third session in a series of webinars curated for you to really explore sustainability practices at the intersection of investors, remuneration and people. My name is Efran Patrick. I'm a partner at Mercer based in Sydney and I work with clients locally and, and globally uh, on their workforce transformation challenges. I'm co-hosting today's webinar with my colleague, Kate Whitehead, who will um, introduce the, and acknowledge the country. Thanks so much, Ephraim. So before we introduce the rest of our colleagues, I'd like to read out the acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities today. We want to make today's webinar an interactive conversation. So you'll see we have some polls for you throughout the session and we'll also leave some time at the end for your questions and we really look forward to receiving those. If you have any questions as we go through, please use the Q&A box you'll see at the bottom of the screen um, in the Zoom window. So back over to you, Ephraim, thanks. Thank you. Um, so in our webinar today, we will explore the changing investor expectations and their expectations on commitment to sustainable practices. We'll also discuss how you uh, as an organization can review the employee value proposition so that your people feel aligned and rewarded for their efforts towards sustainability. We'll find out how executive incentive plans are changing to hold leaders accountable for progress. And at the end, we'll hear some of the latest trends on remuneration for sustainability talent. We have three great Mercer speakers and guests with us today, which I'd like to introduce. Helen. Ty is a principal in Mercer Australia's reward practice. Helen is providing advice on structuring employee and executive pay, including remuneration principles, incentive designs, uh, to really align pay and performance across the organization. And we have got Nithya Abraham. Nithya is a senior associate based in our Melbourne office. Nithya serves as a product leader for the general market remuneration surveys. And she's supporting clients across Australia and New Zealand to make data-driven decisions. And we have our colleague Helga Bergdom. Helga is Mercer's Global Chair of Sustainable Investments, and Helga is based in, in Melbourne. So as a global executive and board member, she's focused on climate change resilience, managing investment risks, investment returns, and reputation for organizations and boards. It's great to have you all here today. So let me just set the scene of our dis discussion today with a, a few data points. In, in our recent 2022 Global Talent Trends study, which captures over 10,000 voices from employees, executives, and HR leaders around the world, we heard that 94% of Australian employees expect their company to pursue a sustainability agenda. Yet, 64% of business executives also told us that they are concerned about their organization's ability to effectively embed sustainability goals in their transformation plans. And the second data point that we'd like to just bring here is from corporate governance research that highlights that 80% of board members say that the frequency of sustainability and ESG topics on board agendas has significantly increased over the last 18 months. So there's clearly a lot of momentum in this area. So what we'd like to do um, for kicking off a, a webinar is to have a poll question to all of you and to hear from you where your organization is on the sustainability journey. Which of those five statements that you see on screen uh, best describes your organization in terms of ESG and sustainability initiatives? Would you describe your organization to be enlightened? You, know, you have to make great inroads and, um, and you are really scaling what you do in, in sustainability quite successfully. Are you a learner? 
you have invested in some of it, but you're still struggling with scale and, and, and making it really sustainable across the organization. Would you say you are more a laggard? Do you really struggling to gain momentum with sustainability and get buy-in? Or you're disillusioned. You might have tried things that have failed and um, and you know things haven't worked out as planned. Or it's not a priority for your organization. We'd love to get your vote and uh, my colleague Kate will will reflect on that in a minute. Yeah, thanks Ephraim. It's, um, it's great to see all of the responses coming in so far. We've got nearly 70, so that's wonderful. I think, you know, what's um, really exciting to see is that the majority of participants on the call are saying they've really invested in new ways of working, um, but are looking to kind of scale more with their sustainability efforts and, and make more inroads. So they describe themselves as learners. That was the majority of people on the call today. And I think um, as we wait for any more results to come in, if we go to the next slide and compare that to what we saw in our global talent trends study this year, um, we can see that uh, our friends on the call have you know, made significantly more progress um, than um, organisations we surveyed both in Australia and globally. So um, there's clearly an a incentive to be on the call today to learn more and progress more. And I think that's a really encouraging sign in terms of those results. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights. And, and Kate, it's interesting to see how the results here kind of compare to the global tolerance. It's quite a, a strong alignment, isn't it? Now, I'd love to bring in my colleague, Helga. Helga is a global sustainability guru, and I'd love to hear from her how investors are driving the sustainability agenda in organizations and what really is their focus at the moment. Thanks, Ephraim. I mean, interesting, those results marry up very well processes as well. So. Uh, it's, uh, Mercer has ratings of its strategies, with ESG1 being asset managers that manage sustainability very well, down to ESG4 where they don't really integrate it at all. And the of that universe of some 5,000 strategies, uh, about 22% would come in the um, very integrated. So it, it matches up well. But uh, back to your question, um, what we see is that investors increasingly want to see their organisations demonstrating authentic commitment to sustainability and follow through and also the evidence for it. So there's a lot of emphasis on reporting. And so for seeing um, management with KPIs, seeing organisations that um, don't just look at sustainability from their own corporate point of view, but also if they have, for example, investments or are associated with um, a super fund, that their investments are aligned as well. So uh, the way many organisations do this successfully is they really need to set out their beliefs and have a vision of where they want to be and how they'll get there. And that's by constructing very comprehensive policies um, that address issues like waste elimination or reduction of pollution in your um, own organization's activities or your supply chain or your, the third parties that you engage and how much you are committing to investing into sustainable um, items and materials and how carefully that is managed, which is really about um, the idea of operating in a circular economy. And we recently produced a paper on the importance of framing up an organisation's activity with that idea of trying to really reduce pollution and waste um, with a group called the Investor Group on Climate Change. But there's also external factors and um, a big one at the moment that all of you I'm sure will be well aware of is this issue of greenwashing, which is really the very opposite of authentic sustainability. And so there's um, a lot of regulation and guidance coming out to organisations. So for investors, the Australian Securities Investment Commission, ASIC, 
has produced guidance recently on greenwashing. And that's the extent to which a financial product or strategy is uh, actually environmentally focused or sustainable or ethical. So greenwashing is something that in the past, many organisations and um, investment related organisations have used to be seen to be uh, sustainable. And it, what it can do is really distort uh, relevant information that a current or prospective investor might read in order to make uh, investment decisions. So we're seeing regulators jumping on this issue of being true to label or as an organisation doing what you say you are doing in this sustainability space. And at one end, this can lead, if it's ignored, to, for example, litigation. So we saw that with the super fund rest where um, there was a case brought that the fund was not adequately protecting members' savings from climate risk. And many of you, I'm sure, would have read about the case in Europe uh, with Deutsche um, Wealth, um, where it um, was, uh, where the prosecutors really said that um, the that Deutsche that they had sufficient evidence to show that environmental, social, and governance factors were not. not taken into account that they were, so that they said they were only taken into account in a minority of cases, and so there's been um, litigation as a result of that. So all of this relates to good, transparent governance, having a clear plan, having good policies, and making sure that those policies are acted on, and then that comes to executive behaviour, KPIs, and so on, which um, my colleagues will go to in this session today in more detail. But as we all know, there are a lot of opportunities in the sustainability space and a lot of dilemmas because there are just so many different issues extending from, for example, modern slavery in supply chains. And here we have obviously regulation now around modern slavery to climate transition and leaving no workers behind in exposed industries. And we have to face the fact that some co companies will not transition to a low carbon or net zero economy. So these are all complex and challenging issues, but we need to address them. There is urgency. And the way to address them, we think, is by going through that process of being very clear about the plan your investment beliefs or your organisational beliefs, your policy, the processes, and then what it is that you actually do and can share uh, with your people and with outside stakeholders. Epron, uh, I'll just continue there. Thank you. That um, leading on um, from that overall framing of what we see on this quest for authenticity around sustainability, there are a lot of ways in which investors communicate their expectations to our organisations. Um, and you can see there along the bottom a whole range of activities that shareholders can use. So it can range from writing a letter to the chair of the organisation of the board right through to um, escalation measures, uh, which can actually ultimately result in investors uh, deciding that the company that they have been a shareholder of is not being authentic, is not delivering on its sustainability commitments, and therefore is really exposed to a number of risks that could ultimately destroy shareholder value. So many investors today work up and down the chain of engagement with organisations and companies into which they are invested through their investment portfolios. So they really work in collaborative groups. So there are a number of groups, um, some based here in Melbourne. So if we're talking about super funds, there's the Australian superannuation um, 
Council of Investors. Um, there's also groups uh, which I've been involved in, the Investor Group on Climate Change, which represents about four trillion of funds under management. And there are dedicated initiatives such as Climate Action 100 that engage regularly with about 100 of the top companies around issues of um, how climate risk is being managed, how people are being transitioned in that process. If there are commitments to net zero, what does it mean for the people and the sorts of business that are being undertaken? Over on the next slide, uh, please. Um, oh, that's my last slide there. Oh, here we are, yes. Um, we do see that investors um, are also looking at the way our organisations are run and governed. So for a very long time, governance, uh, the way the board, uh, management and um, people are really all aligned. So we see here that there's a lot of interest in organisations today about, for example, environmental issues. Um, around climate change and as we're just um, noting what it means for the way the company operates and the people within them. So a lot of work is going on on the importance of boards being able to understand climate risk and we were chatting earlier before this call um, about the importance of science because at the base of everything on climate is science and we need people on our boards who understand science. All of us are very well aware of diversity of decision makers, but also diversity of approaches to these complex challenges that we have in sustainability, whether they are around the actual impact that an organisation is making and what that means for people, the environment, um, the way we use materials, the pollution, the waste, etc. So we need to have diversity of decision makers at all levels in the organisation, but we also need to have diverse thinking because um, no um, one organisation can address all these issues and it's not a case of the smartest person in the room. It's really all about uh, collaborative work and teams working on these sustainability issues together. Human yeah. capital management is key. Yeah, and uh, I think, yes. This is fascinating, just putting a people lens. Obviously, you are working with investors uh, and boards around the world. But it's striking to see how much the people agenda is now top of mind, even in, in the sustainability context, and think reflecting yeah. on how progress in sustainability also has a significant impact on the skills and experiences people need to bring on the board, but also across the workforce. Uh, you mentioned yes. you know, appreciation of science, et cetera. And obviously there are a lot of downstream implications on that. What's very clear is that better work standards have become a top agenda. And Helga, I think you've been involved with the World Economic Forum on some of the, the thinking yes. that went into that, that clearly shows that you know, this is a major concern for organizations around the world and in Australia. And I thought it might be a good Good segue to bring Helen, our colleague Helen, into the conversation. Helen, we'd like to hear from you your perspectives on what companies could or should do to engage their employees in sustainability objectives and initiatives. What, what's your reflection on that? Yes, thank you, Ephraim. I mean, that's a really important question that employers are grappling with. And companies will really need to bring their ESG strategies to life within the workforce and to hold leaders to account. And that may involve including ESG metrics within incentive plans, which we will talk more about in a minute. But to drive cultural change, companies should strive to embed sustainability objectives within day-to-day -day activities. And I think that will be a good question to take to our audience today on how does your organization engage employees with sustainability? and options we've provided as examples are listed below. You can select however many may apply to your organization. And they range from involving employees um, on sustainability challenges through to providing documents and tools to kind of nudge those sustainable behaviors. 
and also to encourage employees to engage in community support. So we'll just give um, participants today to vote, time to vote on that. And this is really interesting because we've provided a range of examples, but I think just showing the results on the screen are really showing that there's a huge cross section of tools available to companies and being able to gain traction on multiple levels and through multiple challenge channels just helps to kind of reinforce the importance of those ESG strategies across the company. It seems like, uh, you know, those uh, that are directly related to practices that people and culture can influence, they vote at the highest, you know, looking at sustainable work practices around well-being, flexible work, continuous learning, we talked about, you know, currency of skills that has rated, you know, really the highest. Um, but also engaging in community support, staff volunteering, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, it's good to see, uh, you know, it's happening across all of those menus. I mean, we could spend probably a whole day just uh, unpacking those, but that's, thank you for sharing that. Um, is that this next slide is, is providing a bit of a diagram on how Mercer approaches the employee value proposition or EVP and the leave as a company has at its disposable to engage with employees. And at the top of that pyramid, we have the purpose of the organization. So an employee may choose to work for your company because the mission and vision aligns with their personal beliefs. You may be a not-for-profit company providing healthcare services or a private company operating in waste recycling, for example. And in the middle of the triangle, we've got the experiential elements of working for a company. And two key categories here include career support and employee well-being. And this layer talks to how a company develops and supports its colleagues to create an inclusive workplace where skill development is prioritized. At the bottom of the triangle, we've got those contractual elements of the employee relationship, including remuneration and benefits. So where a company needs to be competitive against their respective employee talent markets. And one thing to remember is that most companies don't have unlimited salary budgets, so they really need to utilize the various components of the full EVP pyramid to differentiate competitors and engage with their current and future potential employees. But I guess the key question is how can EVP link to sustainability? And if we start at the top of the pyramid, you know, considering the purpose of the organization, Mercer's 2022 Global Talent Trends research from Australia shows that 94% of employees expect their employer to pursue a sustainability agenda that balances those financial results with social issues, diversity, equity, and environmental impact. And as we've heard earlier, companies should really make these values visible and provide opportunities for employees to participate in activities and programs which support these. For example, that could be community programs or encouraging women in traditionally male dominated careers, perhaps through sponsoring training or providing cadet internship opportunities. Companies can also utilize the internal communications team to raise awareness. That could be through running webinars on a broad range of topics, such as diversity, inclusion, and conscious bias. I think what's really important to consider also is reputation. As we saw a record number of employees switch jobs last year during the great resignation, we learned that what influences people to join a new company is critical. And after job security, organizational brand and reputation is the number two reason that people join their current employer. So current and prospective employees expect a company to be really clear on what it stands for. And they're looking for a company's values to shine through in its brand, reward philosophy, benefits, and the overall employee experience. If we go to that experiential level, an interesting statistic from the Global Talent Trends research is that over one third of companies are introducing a strategy to address mental or emotional well-being this year. So looking at creating a differentiated experience for employees is really important. And that could focus on talent development, for example, promoting purposeful learning opportunities, providing employees the space to learn, or celebrating skills-based career moves that are linked to a company's ESG projects. 
but also on the other side, well-being of employees. That may include advancing diversity and equity and inclusion programs, um, transforming ways of working, and supporting people leaders to have really meaningful conversations with the employees. And then finally, at the bottom of the pyramid, thinking of remuneration and benefits, the Global Talent Trends research shows us that 35% of HR leaders plan to individualize compensation and benefits for different groups in their organization. There's a recognition then that one size does not fit all, and understanding what is important to an employee across the whole breadth of the EVP can help employers develop attraction and retention strategies that can resonate across different cohorts of the workforce. And this could include things like recognition programs, which perhaps provide non-monetary benefits. And those awards could be for bringing purpose to life or working on projects for the company linked to sustainability objectives, for example. And within remuneration, I think it's really important to be able to identify potential pay equity issues, understanding the drivers of those, and then being able to manage any resulting pay gaps. I mean, this is really important not just for the attraction and retention of employees, but also to build trust with the workforce. So that kind of leads us to the question, so what should boards do to hold their organizations and themselves to account? And is this through incentive compensation? So let's take the opportunity now to also ask the audience, what are their organizations doing or considering in this area? So does your organization include any metrics related to ESG issues in your incentive plan, such as diversity, inclusion, well-being, or environmental? We've got a few options below, which include, yes, we're utilizing ESG metrics in both short and long-term plans. Maybe it's one or the other. Perhaps you're not using metrics at the moment, but you're thinking about putting them in place, or you're not using them and you're probably not going to. And uh, this is really interesting results because what we're seeing more broadly across the market is that where companies are using ESG metrics, it is mainly in the short term plan. So that's where we're seeing 90% of respondents today saying that, yes, it's within the short term incentive. But a lot of organizations, we've got 51% of respondents saying we are considering them. So there's definitely gaining kind of traction in the market around being able to, I think, understand that there's the metrics there which can really drive behaviors? And then do you drive behaviors by including these metrics within the broader performance management or specifically in an incentive plan? Helen, I mean, it shows that less than 10% of participants here, you know, when you combine answer one and three, less than 10% have it embedded in long-term incentive plans. That's, uh, any reflections on that? Yeah, I think for long-term incentive plans, it does become a little more challenging. A lot of times it is around being able to set targets kind of three, four years out, and especially where there's kind of emerging practices on um, which metrics are used and being able to set targets for metrics which are new and perhaps you don't have historical data to be able to, you know, use projections. I think what we're going to see in the coming years is those percentages really increasing as organizations kind of get used to and have more data in order to be able to set targets related to those metrics. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting to see that 51%, that we don't use them at the moment, we, but we are considering using them. And that might be a good segue to what you're exploring in the next, uh, in the next slide, isn't it? Exactly. And based on research conducted by Mercer in 2021, we have found that for the first time in the US specifically, almost 50% of the top kind of 500 companies in the S&P included ESG metrics of some type in their incentive programs for top executives. And the expectations that we have on reporting so far in 2022 is showing that this could rise close to 70%. Now in Australia, practices obviously varied, particularly across industries. But of course, because of our high prevalence of mining and energy companies, that's where we're really seeing take up high and increasing, but also expanding um, ac across the broader industry group in Australia. And as we just mentioned and saw in the poll, you know, while ESG accomplishments are typically longer term in nature, most companies where they're utilizing them are using them in their short term plan to reward ESG performance. 
And as we saw, we are seeing some companies using their long-term incentive plans to measure ESG performance. Um, and we are expecting that trend to continue as companies become more familiar with those metrics. But when deciding whether to include measures linked to ESG strategy in an incentive plan, it is important to consider firstly, which metrics are most appropriate and the targets set against those metrics to show what good and great look like and really demonstrate progress achieved against those. So companies should also consider whether incentive plans should include ESG metrics as dependent on a company's ESG strategy and their development along that kind of maturity. It may not necessarily be appropriate for every company or perhaps just not right now. And when we're actually developing the incentive plan design and selecting the performance measures, ESG metrics will definitely differ by company and they do need to be tied to the overall ESG strategy. As we heard from Helga earlier, it's not just a case of looking at what competitors are doing and replicating an approach. You know, whilst peer and broader industry practices can be informative, any choices made need to make sense within the context of your organization. And just broadly, it's going to be impossible to capture all sustainability metrics in an incentive plan. The board and management must work to determine the most critical metrics and also how to demonstrate success against those. Which leads us to a second item around setting goals to demonstrate differing levels of performance. So companies will need to examine current data, benchmarks and goals in order to be able to set a baseline from which to improve. You can then define the current state, set those future goals, and very importantly, be able to track progress along the way. Now, the goals that you could be including could be set and articulated qualitatively, and they may allow the board a degree of discretion in determining performance achieved, or quantitatively, where you're setting specific kind of threshold, target, and maximum performance goals to determine the related payouts. And our research is showing that most public companies are using qualitative goals with human capital and diversity equity inclusion measures, but quantitative goals with sustainability and environmental measures. So the external market, including proxy advisors, are seeking to understand the thought process when setting any incentive goals, whether or not they include ESG metrics. But scrutiny is really heightened where metrics are innovative, subjective, or where there is a lack of clear benchmark, as could be the case with many categories of ESG metrics. And obviously there can be situations which just aren't anticipated in advance. For example, the BHP board adjusted management incentives down to reflect poor management in the, their treatment of women at isolated mine sites. So it's important also for boards to consider factors outside of an structured incentive scorecard when making those decisions. And whilst we have been talking about incentives, it's important for remuneration committees to not look at the question of awards in a silo and to ask what other tools are already being used to keep a company on track. And that may include instilling a sense of accountability by a public disclosure. And key areas of disclosure, in addition to, say, a listed company's remuneration report, ESG report, um, they include items such as diversity reporting, but also pay equity reporting, which leads us on to kind of our next topic. Helen, there's actually a live question. I'm wondering if I can just um, bring that to you. There's a question from the audience. Uh, I'm interested in your reflections on which roles or divisions you're seeing ESG measures within incentive plans. Is it focused on a few executives like the CEO or chief sustainability officer or potentially across the executive, um, the range of executives? in the organization, are there any patterns? Do you see it more targeted to specific executive cohorts or across the board? Yeah, and I, th I think this also depends on the company's um, point along that kind of maturity profile. Where are they in embedding those ESG strategies within the organization? I mean, say for example, for a dedicated chief sustainability officer, you would expect within their kind of individual performance assessment, whether that's performance and or incentive, there's going to be some really significant weiting on um, ESG factors, but that's because that's core to their individual role. But what we're really seeing and the trend is seeing is that those measures are going across the executive team. 
you know, at that level of leadership, you're really looking to reinforce a we're all in this together mentality. And everyone has their way of contributing to the greater good, especially at that corporate level. So having a degree of consistency across the full ex executive team is actually important to drive behavior. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, um, I know you also wanted to stress some of the other considerations from a pay perspective that are related to sustainability and equity. Um, I might just bring that up here. Yeah, great, thank you. So and we do have mandatory reporting required by Australian companies with 100 or more employees by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. But what we're also seeing is companies increasingly look to undertake additional pay equity analysis internally in order to gain a greater understanding of whether there are any anomalies and hence put in place any strategies to help address these. And I think being able to communicate to employees that there is a formal policy or approach to undertake those regular reviews of pay equity can really help to build trust. And when looking at pay equity, you can start at a very high level, um, average female to male pay, but it's really important to drill deeper, such as looking at how pay equity varies between males and females by career level, and also for specific jobs. And the chart on our left-hand side provides an illustration of comparing male to female pay by career level, but also split across different business functions. And this type of analysis can help to understand whether there are particular pockets of potential pay inequity that a company can kind of delve into for further consideration. And if instances of potential pay and equity are identified, you can dig deeper still to answer the question, you know, why has this come about? And the example on the right hand side is showing um, Mercer's internal labor map, which we analyze client data and put this together to help a company understand patterns in workforce representation and staff movements to provide additional context to identified pay gaps. And this can include consideration of historic rates of hiring, promotion and exits. And in the example shown based on a real life client, we can see that at the lower career levels, a large proportion of the workforce is female, so that's the purple bar, compared to the males, which is the pink portion. And at level three, which is kind of three levels up from the bottom, there appears to be a ceiling for women. So we're seeing a high rate of females leaving the workforce. And as a result, the proportion of females to males at level four above becomes more evenly distributed between the purple and the pink. And then above level four, increasing proportions of male employees. So the pink bar getting bigger. They're either being hired into the organization or promoted from within. So really getting the data and we, we can find out potentially some drivers that might be influencing the, those pay outcomes. And if a company can identify those drivers, then they can formulate strategies in order to mitigate the impact going forwards. And as we saw in this example, that could include focusing on hiring and promotion practices, which could include our, promote, our opportunities being provided equitably and our joining salaries or promotional adjustments being determined in an equitable manner. And this is this conversation so far has only talked about base pay. You know, you can extend this to consider prevalence of and quantum of bonuses, allowances, and application of other leave and employment policies. And further for variable reward, it can even come back to are employees being rewarded for poor performance or in circumstances of poor behaviors. I mean, if so, this can undermine the performance management process itself um, and also mitigate um, a desire to drive a high performing culture. So, I mean, this analysis above can really help deliver deep insights for role the company has historically always had or roles where there are multiple employees in a role. But in particular for new and emerging jobs, setting pay can be challenging and not just to set, assessing pay equity. And we're seeing this as more ESG specific jobs emerge in the market and the demand for remuneration benchmarks um, in order to help organizations set that pay. And Helen, it's really interesting to look at that analysis, you know, that internal labor market analysis, putting in a gender based lens, which is very powerful to see those dynamics. And I think, you know, we could encourage some of our clients and listeners here 
you could apply many different lenses. You could bring in actually a skills-based lens. You could say who brings a specific lens in, or, or skill in sustainability at what level? And what is the dynamic of people joining, progressing, uh, thriving in your organization? How interesting would that be? Just to understand the, the dynamic that's playing out there. Helen was talking about you know, the, the need for deep scientific expertise on boards. And you know, I've recently worked with a global client uh, in the aluminium industry, you know, supplying aluminium to manufacturing and mainly automotives around the world. And you know, their key account managers, they traditionally used to be really commercially savvy, you know, executive MBA type people. They are now hiring more and more people with a material sciences background into those roles because they will only be credible with a very sophisticated procurement audience that looks at circular economy purchasing arrangements, you know, buying recycled aluminium is a very different game <laughs> to, to what that was before. So it's, it's fascinating how organizations could potentially look at that through many different lenses. And that kind of brings me to the question around the labor pool more broadly. We know from research and our, you know, our, our own um, insights from our benchmarking that Sustainability talent and ESG professionals, they have been growing exponentially over the last couple of years. Yet there's still a significant labor market shortage at the moment in the market. So Nithya, I'd like to bring you in as our expert in remuneration benchmarking. What do you see happening in remuneration for sustainability and ESG talent at the moment? Thanks, Efren. That's, um, that's right. In the recent years, ESG factors have gained um, attention as businesses all over the world adopt sustainable business practices and be socially responsible. As a result, there is a significant need for ESG talent and companies are experiencing fierce competition. Sustainability jobs um, span across a wide range of industries and the demand is growing faster in sectors such as mining and metals, energy, construction, manufacturing, logistics, technology and communication, just to name a few. With a growing number of industries and corporations um, strengthening their focus on ESG, it has become more difficult for companies to attract and retain ESG talent. To gauge the supply side of ESG roles, we looked at the 2020 total remuneration survey data for Australia and saw an increase in the number of ESG roles reported in the 2022 compared to 2020, indicating ESG teams continue to grow in size as companies increase their headcount. Where there might have been one person in a function, now there is a need for specialists across different areas of ESG. We see teams growing from just a sustainability manager plus an analyst to having a dedicated team of people evenly represented across all career streams, starting from professionals to managers and execs. And given the high demand for ESG roles within um, MRSA remuneration surveys, we have added a new ESG specialization this year to our MRSA job library, which captures roles responsible for uh, development and execution of an organizational um, ESG initiatives. Now, when we examine hot jobs, there is clearly a high demand uh, for most roles. Um, but in particular today, we're looking at this example of environmental sustainability. And just to give you an overview of what that role is, um, this role encompasses research and analysis as input to corporate sustainability programs and projects, including uh, monitoring trends in the environmental science, renewable resources, sustainable work processes, and others, other fields. Um, and what I'm going to uh, explain to you is something called as the same incumbent movement. So when we're looking at a year over year salary change, we often refer to same incumbent movement. What this does is it measures individuals um, remaining in the same job within the same organization from one year to the next. And this is a reliable measure of historic remuneration movement as it eliminates any um, result changes due to sample um, such as you know, addition of new employees or survey participants. Um, and it is therefore a good indication of the cost to retain um, employees. So in 2021, the median employment cost, same incumbent movement for an environmental sustainability manager was 2.8%, which is very much in line with our general market movement. Um, 
However, when we looked at the market salary median, this increased by almost 13% over the past two years. So for example, this, uh, in this scenario, the market salary median in 2020 was reported at $165,000 compared to now at 20, um, in 2022, sitting at $187,000, um, which indicates a high demand for these roles in the external market. Another example is of uh, the senior professional role within that same specialization where the same incumbent movement was reported at 2.5%, which is again in line with the general market. Similar to the manager role, we noticed that the median employment cost increased by almost 12% over the past two years. So the market salary median in 2020 was reported at $137,000 compared to now at $153,000. So the new employees in our 2021 and 2022 data samples are driving higher salaries compared to you know, the annual same incumbent movements. And it looks like companies are willing to pay you know, much higher increases to bring these employees on board. Um, and if we look at that next slide, um, this chart here provides a breakdown of a typical salary differential uh, of those jobs compared to the overall general market median for the corresponding um, career level. So what we see here, the roles within the environmental sustainability are paid much higher salaries compared to the general market median for the same career level. So the first one there, um, the environmental sustainability experienced paraprofessional is paid 21% higher salary compared to the median general market salary in the same career level. We also note um, senior professional manager execs are all paid um, quite high compared to the general market salary within those career levels. So which, which indicates companies are willing to pay those premiums, especially for um, roles with a few years of experience. Um, and it also indicates that, you know, the critical talent is relatively in short supply and companies across different industries um, that I mentioned earlier could be dipping into the same talent pool, uh, vying for the same set of people as a result, driving the pay levels up. Yeah, no, you know, just, it's really interesting. And you would assume that some of our participants and audiences might rethink their career aspirations moving from, from PNC to sustainability. And in fact, uh, I've seen uh, quite a few who have done that over the last couple of years. Just before we answer questions from the audience that are submitted through Q&A box, uh, one last question to you, Nithya. Yeah. So looking at the premium paid for sustainability talent, how does this compare to some of the other hot jobs in the market? at the moment. And so, from, so in the last couple of years, from a general market perspective, um, there was a clear acceleration in the digital jobs space uh, with a growing number of startups and large corporations strengthening their focus on digital talent. Um, we saw a high demand for jobs within um, the specialization. So for example, roles in the IT and system architecture, cybersecurity, data science, data analytics, um, so cloud computing, just to, just to name a few, you know, we noted that the premium salaries uh, ranged from five to up to 22% higher compared to the general market median. So very similar to the, you know, to the ESG roles that we just um, saw. Um, also looking at other industries, for example, life sciences, you know, roles within quality management, uh, microbiologists from the engineering and science job family, they were um, you know, there were higher salary expectations in the external market for um, candidates, again, very similar to uh, the um, environmental sustainable roles we discussed. Um, we also noted within the uh, resource and construction engineering sectors as well that premiums up to 25% uh, were paid up to project management roles, um, stakeholder uh, relation roles as well, just to, just to give, you, give you a bit of comparison to what's happening um, in, in the hot job section in the other job markets as well. Thank you, Nithya. They have really, really fascinating insights. I think, Kate, now is a good time for us to pick up some of the questions from the participants through the Q&A, through the Q&A box. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ephraim. We've got a couple through and I just encourage any more of you on the call today to submit some more questions if um, there were any thought bubbles that were sparked for you as we went through the presentation. The first one I think is for Helen and, and maybe Helga as well. Um, 
Could you share more specifically some STI ESG metrics under DE&I employee engagement, et cetera? So what are some of the metrics we're actually specifically seeing that would help you know, measure progress in those diversity, equity and inclusion employee engagement areas? Yeah, so for example, across um, diversity, equity, inclusion, some of the metrics we are seeing include taking action to address racial injustice, whether that's externally, um, meeting diversity goals at specific employee levels. But we're obviously seeing that through to management and the board as well. Um, also an interesting one I saw coming out of the US was increasing supplier spend to minority and female owned firms. So not just thinking internally, but obviously the external impact of those diversity equity decisions. Um, for kind of human capital employee, we obviously got the historical kind of health and safety regarding incident rates, serious injuries, lowering lost work days, but also retaining top talent, um, reducing voluntary turnover, more so succession planning at that executive um, level, um, but also employee engagement surveys, and not just focusing there on kind of satisfaction um, and productivity measures, but kind of a much broader um, understanding of the EVP, as well as how employees are feeling engaged with the company. Um, lots of other measures like tied to environmental stewardship, you know, reducing CO2 emissions, prioritizing green energy, um, recycling, water management, um, that type of thing as well. Thanks, Helen. Um, Helga, I don't know if you have anything to add in terms of, you know, what investors are looking for in terms of measuring progress on, on sustainability initiatives. And we also have another question for you um, around the skills that you need in your board to drive authentic change. So related to what you were talking about before in that, you know, there's a lot more expectation to have those, um, you know, technical skills on a, on a board or in a management team around, you know, actually knowing about the science and having that expertise. So do you have any comments yeah. there? Yes, I mean, I think um, Helen's set up very well um, what is expected of uh, the organisation and then that does map across to the investor side as well. You know, investors are looking for um, the management of those sorts of issues, sometimes um, framed by um, global frameworks like the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but at the board level, we do see a lot of change in boards in terms of their requirement to really come to grips with some of these um, kind of uh, macroeconomic issues, the systemic risks that um, we look at in terms of global risks reports with, that we work on with the uh, groups like the World Economic Forum. And you'll see that environmental risks like climate change, resilience, um, and uh, extreme weather and uh, climate transition always come out very high on in terms of impact and likelihood. So the boards really need to understand these issues. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, the importance of having um, an understanding of the science when it comes to climate as to why it's um, imperative for organisations to respond. Um, also to have uh, a well-informed board around a lot of these sorts of risks, so an understanding of what's often called the just transition that I referred to earlier, which is um, to help people in organisations that may be in an exposed industries that can't easily transition to a uh, net zero economy, um, how do we sort of repurpose those organisations? And Ephraim gave a great example, and there are many examples where we could see the repurposing, bringing people along. Um, so I think we're getting a lot of demand from boards and coming back to uh, what I also mentioned, establishing very clear view of what are the beliefs of the board, bringing the board around the table, to discuss and come to common ground on what is our purpose? What do we want to achieve on sustainability? And there can be divergence of views, but the way we work with boards is to find common ground. And then those beliefs and vision really drive 
what policies say, and then it cascades through the organisation. But it's so important for the contemporary board to have a comprehensive view of what position they want to take in these extraordinary times and to understand that everything is changing and evolving. We are in transition. And so we can't stop and we can't wait for the perfect data. Um, we're not perfect people and the boards are just trying to get information from experts, but also to recruit differently. And when they're bringing in directors to the board, they really need to be looking at people that have expertise, as we were saying earlier, science expertise, mm -hmm. understanding the social impacts of what we do in business. Thanks. Thanks so much, Helga. And um, in the uh, Q&A box, we're having a little bit of a discussion, I think, around um, some more detail on those STI um, and even LTI metrics. And um, just a question whether we're seeing companies you know, moving towards more measurable, specific targets and, and less of the soft, easy aspects of ESG KPI setting, for example, you know, greenhouse gas reduction targets or packaging goals, zero plastic, you know, things that are actually kind of, um, you know, really measurable. Are, are we seeing more of that um, in the general market? Maybe Helen. Yeah, there's, there's definitely an increase in those metrics which have those quantitative performance goals being set against them. And I think that's really being driven by companies having developed kind of more structure and reporting internally in able to, you know, kind of document this um, forecast and set those targets going forwards. Um, I think it's, it's still important to kind of reflect that there's going to be a lot of metrics out there which are going to be assessed in a qualitative manner. Um, and where that's really important is to have like a formal um, kind of discretion application framework in place so that management and the board can really clearly document the thought process and rationale for decisions made with consideration of the impact on the broader stakeholder group and especially for listed companies, that type of information um, that's being provided to the broader investor community will be really important. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I can see there are quite a few more questions that are coming through the Q&A panel, including, you know, how can you keep it real? I mean, Helga referred to the greenwashing earlier. I, I think it's just being conscious of time. We have only two minutes left. I think we'll pick up some of those questions in our, in our uh, debrief with you. Uh, but just wanted to um, just quickly highlight um, a couple of things as we close out. Firstly, I want to really Thank uh, Helga, Helen, Nithya, and Kate for sharing their experiences and insights. I think they've all given us a lot to think about. Um, there are, this is a, a part of a broader um, um, webinar series. You might have participated in, in an earlier webinar in March where we explored the five dimensions in designing organizations for sustainability success. We had great turnout there. Uh, we had another one in May where we explored the interface of sustainability with culture and the people experience. Again, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of people uh, joining that one. We've got another one coming up in September where we'll explore with a deep dive into the talent market dynamics for sustainability jobs and sustainability skills because uh, there are more and more hybrid uh, roles emerging in that space. It's a fascinating area. So we would love to really capture your feedback uh, just before you sign off. Um, and also, um, you know, in the follow-up materials, you will receive the slides, you will receive the resources from today's webinar. If you have any questions, please get in touch with any of the speakers of today. Um, and again, to my panelists and uh, colleague Kate and team, thank you and to all of you. Thank you very much for joining today. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you and have a great day.